I really want to compliment the speakers. I, I have to be honest, this is the first time I've ever moderated a panel where I didn't have at least one speaker running over. And I guess because they were talking about unfunded liability, yes. <coughs> they, um, they hit their target. Um, so we have uh, three uh, great resources here. And, um, do we have three? and we have about 10 minutes to question them. So if you'd like to speak. I, I just I, I would imagine that all the speakers have some awareness of the the, the, the kind of legal backgrounds of pension law. I think we talk more about their institution as a kind of social factor, attractiveness to workers, improvement of civil service, changes in ideas about why government workers were there, and a little less about the actual legal status of those pensions. Although Josh's uh, presentation, I thought, indicated. That if we if we aren't correctly valuing the pensions, then in a sense they aren't they can't be guarantees. You can't have it both ways. Uh, and and the question I had, which is one being asked to an extent in Rhode Island, uh, is the extent to which you recognize states as grappling with this notion of of pensions as legal guarantees. That now, now, I do believe that uh, Eileen mentioned that there are some states that protect them constitutionally. I, I think in, in, in Rhode Island, uh, the situation it, it particularly is otherwise. And we view more to the constitutional rule that you know, a legislature now can't promise a future benefit. Uh, they can pass a law that there is such a thing, but a later legislature, as ours just did, can take it away. I mean, that's being litigated. I tend to think constitutionally the reform will survive. Have you, have you looked at the extent to which uh, Rhode Island can actually be an example for reform elsewhere due to these, uh, due to these legal uh, limitations? Um, I, I think it's an interesting question. and I'm just going to throw a thought out there. Um, I know in Rhode Island, you, you passed a law that um, says we're not going to default on our debts, on our general obligation debt, that that will be protected first. And I wonder it, what kind of signal that might send to the nature of these promises the um, public sector uh, retirement promises. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to, uh, being done right now, I think, on the, the legal protections around pensions um, and how you know, the courts decide is, is going to be a factor. Um, hi, my name is um, Bill Falanowski. I'm a reporter at the Providence Journal. I've been covering the Central Falls bankruptcy. And the receiver. Yeah, here, here. I've been covering the receivership and bankruptcy in Central Falls the past couple of years. And one question I had for panel was, um, how unusual is it in Central Falls, for example, um, the receiver came in and slashed pensions for fire, retired firefighters and police officers up to 55%. It's my understanding in California you cannot do that in Stockton and San Bernardino, two bankrupt cities. And is there any talk of challenging that state law in California to go after the retirees' pensions and balance the budget? You know, my, my understanding with Fullerton, California, is that the bankruptcy judge gave very wide scope to the um, to the constituents at the table to, if necessary, cut and renegotiate um, pension payments. But the, the outcome of the bargaining that, that that went on was such that those pension benefits were actually still maintained. So I, I, I think in, in states where Chapter 9 bankruptcy is allowed, and I should mention, by the way, that there are many states in which Chapter 9 bankruptcy is not allowed, taking this completely off the table. You know, in states where it is allowed, um, there is usually some scope for, um, you know, for, 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 for changing uh, crude benefits, at least so far as my understanding. And, and are you guys aware of this happening in other places where um, a receiver went in and, and substantially slashed well, Pritchard, Alabama, was a, uh, a, a city that uh, went, went went through municipal bankruptcy. I think what's 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 interesting is that you know this is kind of you know we've seen this happening in, in, in a number of economically depressed towns. And what what happens when you have a city that actually uh, um, you know is still uh, you know up until the point of crisis still kind of humming along? Uh, what, what what's going to happen then with these with these promises? How are they going to get worked out? Um, just. Point of information, I noticed you had Coventry, Rhode Island in your, in your slide. The Coventry Fire District ran out of money, I think, two weeks ago, and allegedly, the, I think it's still true that the firemen are working for nothing. I don't know how long that could last, but just to uh, show you how this 
is where we're sitting in the road. I have uh, two questions. The first one's technical. The, the GASB standards, we can call it a fiscal cliff, that they're going to come into play, I think, very soon. But there's an out, right? If you make your, you, I want you to explain it to me. If you, if you correctly make your actuarially assumed assumptions, you don't have to satisfy that new standard. Tell me about that, and if that's right. And the second question I have uh, is related to what Joseph Farrell was just talking about. Is there any move to change the law so that states can, in fact, file bankruptcy? Because as the, the Chapter 9 federal goes out, there's no place, literally no court, where they can file a piece of paper. The, the, the city can, and the, the Trent Bank and Bridge authorities can, and the, the Bay Commissions can, the state itself cannot file anywhere. And would it be possible for a state to pass a state receiver statute allowing itself to file bankruptcy in its own state? I, that's not often used, but Central Falls, for instance, went to federal bankruptcy, but it could have gone to Rhode Island receiver room had it, had it chose to do that. So I'm wondering about that. Interesting. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, t t t take a brief attempt to try to, try to answer that. Um, so uh, on, um, on the question of the new GASB rules, so uh, what, 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 what the um, speaker was referring to are that there are some new, new GASB provisions that are coming in um, that say that uh, if, so GASB came under, has come under a lot of criticism and has responded by uh, proposing some new rules that where, where, where they say we're still going to basically maintain the suspected return discounting, but if you are at a point where there is some future date where you, the state government or the local government, project that the pension assets are going to be exhausted, then for cash flows after that date, uh, then you have to use some lower rate. And the result is going to be that for some very distressed municipalities, there are going to be some lower rates used. You know, what the, uh, your question is, what is the out? You know, will this affect everyone? And when, when I read the GASB rules and when I read GASB's comments on the comments that have been submitted, it sounds to me, and maybe you can weigh in on this as well, as though uh, the governments are going to be allowed to sort of, yeah, consider past contribution behavior, also consider future revenue streams, and that, in fact, many will still be allowed to sort of say, well, you know, assuming that the assets that we got are earning 8%, and assuming that we'll have these revenue streams that we're projecting to grow at a certain rate, then we'll be okay and we're going to be able to keep using the regular rate. So I think the, the, the scope that they will have uh, is still a little bit unclear. As for the, um, uh, the state bankruptcy, a uh, very interesting suggestion you had about can the, could the state potentially declare bankruptcy under its own rules. I never thought about that. Um, I'll defer to other panel members if they had. That sounds very interesting. I was at a congressional hearing about uh, the federal congressional hearing about um, a you know, the possibility of a chapter for states uh, to restructure their debts. And I will say that um, the 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 everybody who was there uh, from um, either the municipal bond industry or from the state and local governments themselves seemed to hate it. Uh, and uh, it, did, it seemed that we were going nowhere fast with that, and the hearing, uh, I think, degenerated pretty quickly into um, some theatrics about some other unrelated topics. <laughs> uh, yeah, on, on, on the GASB rules, um, that's right. I think it's interesting to note that there may be the incentive, others have pointed out, that the new GASB guidance may actually encourage more risk taking in the assets. Um, Delaware, for instance, is 80% funded according to current GASB rules right now. If they move uh, to, to, to riskier assets, well, the new rules will almost encourage them to take a riskier position because they will maintain that higher funding level. And also, they, they are uh, only for reporting purposes. It doesn't say anything about you must fund according to this new scenario. It's just for reporting purposes. But related to that, Moody's is now going to start a grading pension systems based on a, a corporate bond rate, which is 5.5%. So you're going to start seeing uh, some numbers coming out that are a lot less rosy in, in terms of uh, pension liabilities in state and local governments. I'd like to just add one, one other thing about uh, the unfunding, uh, unfunded liability here. I mean, certainly the interest rate and the discount rate is an important component. But even using the 8%, there are a lot of states and local governments that are significantly <coughs> underfunded. Uh, this just makes it a lot worse. So uh, we can talk about changing the discount rates, but still you need to think about how are you going to make the a, a sufficient annual contribution on a regular basis to pay for these plans. And I think that's the more general fiscal policy that uh, states, cities, counties uh, must address 
is how do we get back to the case where if you're accruing this liability, uh, you're going to pay for it. And I think that's sort of a fundamental issue that, uh, that we need to keep in mind. The discount rate makes it a lot worse. Good times worse. Okay, time for one more question. Yes, uh, I just thought it was interesting that where the title of this uh, seminar really is how the municipalities are diffusing the fiscal timeline. And I, I don't think they really are when you look at you know, all across Rhode Island. You know, let me tell you why, and then I have a question. You know, we're looking at pension reform based on future employees. We're not addressing the current unfunded liabilities right now. Uh, we don't have consistent discount rates between cities and towns. We have our Rhode Island uh, Municipal Pension Commission you know, where the cities and towns have to put their actual reports in. You know, Providence, for example, I think they reduced theirs from 8.5, 8.25. War went from 8% to 7.5. So, you know, we're setting up, you know, definitions of what's a critical status, for example, for pension plans. And, you know, they set a state law of 60%. But when you look at towns, like, for example, if we have five plans. One plan is technically in critical status. And there's laws that they're setting up saying that, well, these pension funds over the next, I don't know, 20 years, you have to get up to 60% funding. But, you know, I, I think what you have to do is you, you can't just pigeonhole and take a look at one critical status pension plan. It's like if, if I have five credit cards and I pay four, the balance is zero, and I have $100,000 on one, and you want me to pay more on that, well, it's going to affect your budget, it's going to affect your funding on all your other credit cards. So. My question is, it looks like, you know, politically the easy thing is to have a revenue solution to the problem. Let's just keep dumping more money. You know, let's just keep increasing taxes. So can you comment on, do we really need to start taking a look at the expense side and really start looking at cutting maybe some of the benefits? And, and in terms of OPEB, for example, can you really have it all? Can you give employees lifetime health care, uh, a pay-as-you-go system, and then on top of that, give them pension plans that you, in my opinion, you can't have at all, and there's going to have to be some kind of a give. Thank you. Um, I, I, I just try to get as succinct as responses that we want to get on to. I want to give you a response, but to make it as succinct as possible would be very nice. Okay. Um, I, I would just say that when you look at these pensions, look at the whole budgetary picture, all of the pension systems, OPEB, your resources, and you look at things on a case-by-case -case basis, a town-by-town -town basis, really, so you get the full picture <coughs> of what the resources are uh, in that town and the options. And I think OPEB, you're going to see cities possibly moving to, to Medicare or something. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, our VIBAs, which is what the Voluntary Employee Benefit Association, what the, what the car companies did. I actually think on, you know, on, on the need to, to, to raise revenues, I mean, in our analysis on the revenue demands paper that you cited, Rhode Island is not that far away uh, in terms of um, you know, the, the, the contribution rate that it's making now. It, it's not that far away from, from, uh, from being sufficient um, to, 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 to pay if, if these cost of living adjustment uh, suspensions are continued because that, that cost of living adjustment suspension, uh, while probably felt very uh, painfully by retirees, also um, saved the state a lot, uh, a lot of money. Well, I want to thank our panel uh, very much for the